Uh, Jim Harris uh, joins me this afternoon on the show. Jim, I know I'm not going to be the first one to say this. I'm probably not going to be the last either, but welcome to Lafayette. Jim, are you there? I am here, yeah. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I pressed the wrong button. Uh, welcome to town. Uh, you're not in town yet, but I understand you got a place to live, so I can say welcome to town. That exactly right. Yeah, just uh, trying to finalize all that today, but it uh, looks like I found a spot, and Looking forward to locating and becoming part of the Lafayette community. You were you were uh, selected out of a total of sixty nine applicants for this job. Resumes that came from all over the country. In your point of view, what is it about the Rage and Cajun brand that made this job uh, perhaps uh, so desirable for a lot of people? Yeah, you know, that's that's a good question, and, and you know, you're right. I was going through a process here. You know, in, in our line of work, you get contacted a lot of times by places, you know, headhunters. You, you have – it's not a very big industry. I mean, it's very much like coaching what we do. There's only so many jobs, you know, at this level in, in terms of philanthropy, you know, working with athletic departments. So we know a lot of each other in this industry, and we, we certainly know a lot of the search firms and things like that. But to be honest with you, this is an opportunity I sought out. You know, I saw this position – posted and i knew you know what was happening down there in lafayette and i knew it from afar you know i had i had never been to campus or anything like that but i had seen the team compete before at other places and certainly on television and things like that i knew the excitement and the, and the fan base just you know looking at the the crowds you've had at the new orleans bowl and things like that i knew the passion for raging cajun athletics and no one had to sell me on that you know and so i sought this position out i i applied for it and and was lucky enough to get an interview, which was what I wanted, just to get down there and see the place. And I was sold, you know, right away. The the excitement of the community, the how welcoming everybody was. You know, I, I'm actually from a small town in the Midwest in Indiana, and you know, I I value, I have those values and those morals and that friendliness and that small town feel and that family feel. And that is a part of that Lafayette community. That is a part of Louisiana athletics and and, and the University of Louisiana. So. You know, just to get that feel and be a part of it, uh, once I got to campus, you know, I was sold. And, you know, it's, again, from afar, looking at the athletics and knowing what the baseball team has done and seeing the men's basketball team in the NCAA tournament a few years ago and, the you know, the success of the softball team and, and certainly, as I've already mentioned, football with the four straight bowl games and the wins and all that, you know, it just – um, that that excitement and that that growth of Louisiana athletics is what was really exciting, and, and seeing now the facility investment that they're they've already made and they're looking to make, you know, it's a great time to be a part of it. I I got to ask you, and this really doesn't have anything to do with the job, but as someone who has been looking at this university from afar, how confusing is it to people outside the area to hear and see Louisiana, Louisiana Lafayette? ULL, yep. UL-L, and everything else. How uh, <laughs> how tough is that for people to go ahead and wrap their arms around? Yeah, you know, um, again, because I'm in this industry and I and I've I've seen the games on TV and I see how you know they the school has wanted the name lifted, you know, in the box scores and things like that. I knew it was the University of Louisiana, but I'll be honest with you, a lot of people still refer to it as Louisiana Lafayette. They don't even say University of or anything. But my colleagues, you know, around the country say, oh, congratulations on Louisiana Lafayette. You know, I was still getting that just over the last couple days. And so I think there is a little bit of brand confusion there, I'll be honest with you. But I think that the university is is doing the right things in terms of branding itself as the University of Louisiana. And, you know, everybody knows the Raging Cajun brand. It's just making sure, you know, that's a catchy nickname. It's a sexy nickname. Everybody knows it. You know, they like to say it. It's kind of fun to see it. And the the logo with the pepper on there, you know, it's, it's great. And so it's just associating that with University of Louisiana. And that's just going to come with time and with the branding on a more national level. And, and again, athletics is a wonderful way to do that because it's so visible. You know, it's, it's a free advertisement in a lot of ways. If, you, if your brand's on ESPN or ESPN2 or ESPNU or, or, you know, making an NCAA tournament and, and those college rankings are in USA Today and when Louisiana is up there in the top, you know, 5, 10, that, that branding is just going to keep getting out there. And so that association will, will certainly come with time. Someone told me recently when it comes to fundraising that it's both an art and a science. And that, that really kind of intrigued me. So I, I'd like to ask you, how do you define the art of fundraising? And how would you define the science of fundraising? And is one more important than the other? Sure, that's a great question. And I actually use those same terms as well. So I believe in, in that statement. And really, the you know, 
art, what we say art, there's a lot of different ways to make a painting look beautiful. There's a lot of different types of art. There's a lot of different types of pictures and scenery and just different things. And it's, it can be beautiful to one person and not so much to the other, but there's a lot of different ways to get it done. And, and so that's what we refer to as, as the art of fundraising. There's a lot of different personalities. There's a lot of different types of people. There's a lot, you know, some people like to enter a room and they're immediately the center of attention and people gravitate towards them and they're very outgoing and they can go around and shake hands. Other people are a little more quiet or a little more meek and, and a little more structured in the way they do it. it. Both ways can be effective. It's just, it just depends on the execution and, and really that person's personality. So that's what we would refer to as the art of fundraising. You know, the science of fundraising is really the strategy, the professionalism, the numbers behind it. And that's, that's really what people see from, you know, behind the scenes perspective. You know, most, most donors and most prospects and most people that are involved in an organization like RCAF, if they're at a football game and they go to a hospitality area or they go to a stadium club seating area or suite area or whatever, you know, they, they can they see people in my position or they see the athletic director, Scott Farmer, and all this, and we shake their hands and we talk to them. Well, the science of that happens behind the scenes when we get back to the office. We, there's the university, through University Advancement in John Bloom's area, you know, they have a database that really tracks all of this information. So as fundraisers, we are required to track our contacts, track our visits, track our phone calls, track our conversations, record as much information as we can, only because it helps everybody. And we all have access to that so we can read about, you know, any alums that we've made contact with and, and anybody that we're hoping to reach out to. And, you know, the universities have wealth screening data that they, you know, if you're an alum of the university, at some point you're going to have a wealth screen done on you. It's just what all universities do. And then, you know, they, they reach out to those individuals based on, on what your interest was. So if you're a business major, maybe you start getting documents from the College of Business. Or if you bought season tickets when you were a student or attended games when you were a student, maybe you would hear from athletics. So that's the science behind it. We'll use that data that we have and the information that development officers capture and try and bring a strategy to the table on how to best work with that individual to achieve, obviously, what we're looking for, but more importantly, what the donor and what the prospect is looking for. Is this an avenue they want to stay connected to their university through? Is this an area that they want to help support philanthropically? You know, that's what we do. We set that up. We try and connect the, the end user, the donor, uh, to, to the university or back to the university as, as much as possible. And so that's using that data is, is the science. And then the art is actually you, how you like to do that, how you like to accomplish that. The um, personality. There's been so much, um, you know, said here locally, and I know that that you're not privy to a lot of that because you haven't been around here uh, a whole lot. But but fans have been clamoring uh, when it comes to the Raging Cajun Athletic Foundation for a point system that would reward those people that are uh, buying tickets, people that are maybe uh, donating money to sports specifics, as opposed to just going by what they're giving to the general fund of the RCAF. Now, I know from mm-hmm. talking to somebody over there that they basically got a point system uh, basically done, but they were waiting for an executive director so they could look at it and make sure that it was done right. So my first question is, have you seen it? And uh, and my second question would be, uh, how important is that point system toward making as many donors as possible happy? Yeah, um- so I'll answer the first the first part of that um, at first here. I have not seen it yet. However, I have had discussions on it with the individuals that have been involved in doing research and getting a draft done of that system. We've had discussions, and they're going to send me the materials that they have and really what they've put together so I can take a look and offer my opinions, and, and when we're, really we can start working on it from there together. So I'm anxious to see. I, I've heard they've made pretty good progress, and they've done a lot of research. And they really looked at that uh, in depth. And so I'm anxious to see what they've got and, and what's been accomplished. So I should be getting that here soon. In fact, they, they told me I should be expecting that sometime this week. So I'm anxious to get that. In terms of your second question, you know, that's a very good one because really what a priority point system does, it's, it's the whole purpose of it is to be as fair and equitable as possible. And, and I know that some people will, will look at a point system and they'll immediately be scared because it's changed. It's different than what's happened before. It's, you know, what does this mean for me? How does it affect me? Well, how does it affect my friends? Can we still get our seats together? Those are all the questions that you normally get when you're talking about implementing a point system. But the whole purpose of it is to make sure that nothing 
you know, that, that isn't equitable is, is going on. It is a it is system to treat everybody fair, and you need some kind of criteria to base, the, you know, those individuals' contributions and, and loyalty to the university and to the athletic department. And so that's what you're really trying to measure. And I think a, a true, a, a, you know, a fair priority point system is going to be an equal measure of loyalty and contribution to the athletics department. And that can be, you know, loyalty meaning how long have you been a season ticket holder? How long have you been coming to games? How long have you been donating to RCAF? And, you know, I know that at Louisiana, they don't go back as far as some other institutions do. You know, when I was at, I, I was at Indiana University for five and a half years, a very old traditional Midwest Big Ten institution that's had a priority point system. I started there in 2004. And when I got there, that, the the varsity club is what they called it had been around for 50 years and they had had a priority point system already in place for about 25 or 30 of those years so they were very much on the forefront in our industry of setting up a system to balance loyalty and contribution and and so that's what we're really trying to do that and and to catch up to some of those institutions in some regard you know a lot of these schools at the well really all of the schools at the large larger conferences in what we would consider larger conferences, more revenue generating conferences in our industry, they all have priority point systems. It's it's common. I mean you just throw that, that word out there and everybody knows what it means. But here we've got to create that culture of of making sure our, our donors and our fans and our alums and our supporters, our constituents, they need to know what that term's gonna mean and they need to know what it's gonna mean for them. And and this is a process that's gonna take some time. I'm all about the transparency the communication in a process like this, and it takes time. And so really we're, what we'll be looking at is that loyalty in terms of contributions to our CAF and total contributions, and then loyalty in terms of season tickets to, to our, all of our different sports. And, and you weight those things, and it, and it comes out to a point total. And in addition to those two, there can be other areas like contributions to the university, um, being a member of the Alumni Association, whatever it may be, there's other ways that you can kind of add what we would call bonus points or add-ons based on how holistic you are in your support of the university. And that's really what we're trying to do is, you know, at the end of the day, we want everybody just to be involved in this university in some way that they can. Obviously, I'm representing athletics from a fundraising perspective, so I'm going to try and get them involved in athletics if I, if I can. But donor intent is the key. If, if someone wants to give the College of Business, I'm not going to try and steer their gift towards athletics, that wouldn't be fair for me. It wouldn't be fair for the College of Business, and it wouldn't be a good representation of the university. So if they want to support business, maybe we can still help them out in our point system. And, and so that's all that we need to look at and, and see and kind of weigh that together and see what makes the most sense for the University of Louisiana. Jim Harris is the new executive director of the Rage and Cajun Athletic Foundation. He's our guest this afternoon at Bird's Eye View. When we come back, we're going to talk about the subject of reseeding and How did Jim manage to do that for Indiana basketball and not get shot? We'll talk about it when Bird's Eye View continues in a minute on ESPN1420and.com. On air at 1420 a.m., online at ESPN1420.com, we are Lafayette Sports Authority, Sports Radio ESPN 1420. ESPN 1420 and ESPN1420.com. Jay Walker, it's Bird's Eye View on this Monday afternoon. The new executive director of the Raging Cajun Athletic Foundation, Jim Harris, is my guest this hour. When when Charlie Monclaw, the chairman of the uh, search committee, announced you uh, as the new executive director, he said one of the things that impressed him and that he thought was crucial was the fact that you had experience in reseeding uh, over at the University of Indiana. Now, I didn't know much about what reseeding was, and then I found out a little bit what it was, and you're getting ready to be in a situation where by next basketball season there will be a new seeding configuration in the Cajun Dome. Hopefully before too long we'll be talking about a new facility at ML Teague Field for baseball. And at some point in time, we're going to be building uh, that monstrosity on the west side uh, of Cajun Field. So reseeding obviously is going to be something that's going to rear its head sooner or later. Uh, you know, just as there's an, an art and a science to, um, to fundraising, is there also an art and a science to reseeding? Yeah, I think there, there definitely is. I mean, again, it, it's, you, what you're dealing with in a reseeding situation is you're, you're dealing with people that feel ownership over their seats. If, if an arena or a stadium 
hasn't been reset in a while. That means people that just keep re-upping and doing their tickets get the same seats every year, and some are happy with them and some are frustrated because they want to see movement. How do I get better? How do I get better? Well, you're blocked. You know, everybody's renewing. And so when you when you create a system that makes it somewhat competitive for the best seats, it, it gives people that wouldn't have otherwise have the opportunity to move into those seats, it gives them a window to be able to do that. And it also allows a university, you know, when, when you've got rising costs of tuition that we have to pay for our student athletes and, and you've got, you know, state cut, budget cuts all across the country, which a lot of states are, have been doing over the last few years. And, uh, you know, you've got all these issues. There's always, you know, you've got a cost of attendance issue that we're talking about is, as the NCAA is looking at, you know, paying athletes and, and kind of getting away with that amateurism status. All of these are issues in our business right now, the sport, um, I'm sorry, the business of sport. And so these are, these are what an athletic director deals with every day, what a university president deals with every day. So you need, you know, if, if, if television revenue is not there like the SEC or the Big Ten or, you know, a Pac-12 or something like that has, then you've got to find ways to creatively generate more revenue, whether it be ticket sales or advertisements or donations or whatever it may be. So we're always looking for ways to, you know, to create the best fan experience as possible, but at the same time, you know, bring that enthusiasm and that passion for our athletic product uh, on the field as it helps the student athlete, uh, their whole experience at the university. So, you know, it's a, it's a delicate situation because, again, you're talking about change and you're talking about something different than what people are used to, but the communication behind it, the explanation behind why it's necessary, every program in the country that competes at a high level does this, and they do it whether it's every year or every few years, it's being done. And, and, you know, that's where University of Louisiana, that's where the, you know, Raging Cajun Nation, that's what we're trying to get to, trying to build it to that point. So that, that's all those things that you have to look at and balance when looking at a situation like a receiving. All right, let me, let me try to break this down to the lowest common denominator. Here's a hypothetical for you. I am a longtime season ticket holder for football. I've had those seats for 20 years, and my dad had them for 20 years before that. I don't ever want to give these seats up. They might not be the best seats in the world but they're my seats. Yep. Let's suppose it's time to reseat and you're looking at level of giving and everything else. Before you give my seats away or before you sell them to somebody else, a better way to say it, are you going to come to me and say, look, these seats, if you want these seats, your point level has got to be such and such or your level of giving has to be such and such and give me an opportunity to reach that level rather than just take the seats? Absolutely. That, that, ha- that has to be the way you do it. it. You have to reward those individuals and give them an opportunity, those that have been with you and been around, and you've got to tell them this is what we're looking to do and you know, this is what the expectation would be for you to maintain. And I'm actually a believer, and again, I, I need to vet this with the committee and really talk through this, so this is just my experience at past places, but you know, I, I'm a believer too that the, the more loyal they've been, they, they actually have an opportunity to do it at maybe a little bit less because of that loyalty. Again, it's, it's a balance of loyalty versus total contribution. That's really what a, the essence of a priority point system is. It's measuring those two things. Their total lifetime, well, it's almost three things. Their total lifetime contribution, their current annual contribution, and their total loyalty in terms of consecutive years of bulk donating and buying tickets. And so those individuals that have been doing it a long time you know, if this is the if it's X points or X dollars to maintain this seat, maybe if you've been, you know, a season ticket holder for ten years or more, maybe you get it at twenty at at eighty percent of that that value or eighty percent of that point total or whatever. There, there's ways to look at that and do that, but we've got to look at what makes the most sense for University of Louisiana. You know, I, I need to really to give my honest opinion on that. I need to really look at the data and and even know how far back our data goes in terms of season ticket holders and, and donate you know donations and contributions and things like that. But yes, that scenario will exist in some fashion. I um you know, I, I joked about something before I went to the break, but I want to ask you a little bit seriously now. I don't know if you've never if you've never been there, I don't know if anybody can can really accept and understand uh, when somebody talks about the passion of Indiana basketball. Um, you guys did a reseeding uh, at the um, at the arena there, and and how did you manage to do it? Because I would imagine with the kind of passion they have, it couldn't have been an easy thing to do. Yeah, and and it was it was certainly challenging. I, I would I would use that word, but it was also I think very beneficial and rewarding for everybody that was involved. And I'm talking from the fan standpoint. 
you know, I again, you gotta, you really do need to understand it. I think you put it in a good context there. I am from a small town in southern Indiana. You know, when I was, both of my parents went to Indiana University. That's why my alma mater, my sister went there. When when you talk about Indiana University basketball in this state, people don't understand. I mean, it's a bit, you know, they made that movie Hoosiers out of high school basketball and. You know, my high school gymnasium of the town I lived in was bigger than the total population of my town. So think about that for a second. You could fit 7,000 people in our high school basketball arena in a town of 5,500. And when we had our sections, we would sell it out. So that, that just tells you the not just in our community, but in the, the entire community coming to support. So that's what basketball means to this state. So now you go to the highest level of basketball in this state historically. You know, and I'm, you know, Butler and Purdue, and you've got some Notre Dame, you've got some great programs in the state of Indiana, but historically, Indiana with winning five national championships and so on, there's a lot of passion there. And and Assembly Hall, the basketball arena, was built in 1971, and you're exactly right. We we had people that would came up to us and said, my father owned these seats. They did a handshake with so and so that said, if I donated this land Assembly Hall was built on that I'd never get my seats taken away. I mean, not documented stuff, but but comments that we heard from people left and right. And so what you know, what we really had to do was take a look at that entire history of of where these individuals were, were seating. And you know, this was a time that this was before the Big Ten network was announced. And so you've got an institution like Indiana that was maybe operating on a forty five million dollar athletic department budget going up against an Ohio State, which at the time might have been about $105, $110 million budget. So, you know, that's like a, a major league baseball team competing with a minor league team in the same conference, you know, in terms of budget. So it was very difficult for us without TV money. We had to find ways to come up with as much as we could, and basketball was our ability to capitalize, and we weren't capitalizing on it. I was going out and visiting with donors and alums left and right who said, Look, I just want basketball tickets. What do I need to do to sit free throw line extended in row 20? And I said, there's nothing we can do because we we're not receding right now. And, and that's a hard conversation. You're turning down a lot of contribution. You're turn, turning down a lot of things. It's just running a bad business, really. And and that's a lot of what we do, you know, is a business. We need to try and run a balanced budget. You know, we're, we're held accountable to that by university presidents left and right all across the country. So we need to do the best we can is running our athletic departments to, to have a balanced budget. So you have to capitalize on, on any kind of opportunities that you have. And, and at Indiana, that's one that we had. So we decided to, you know, and, and I can get into the logistics of it, but I don't want to bore you with it, but we decided that we needed to open up some inventory and really kind of look at that reseeding and see how that would shake out in terms of generating new donors, new contributions, new season ticket holders, fresh blood, all those type of things into the program. You know, you you everybody talks about uh, uh, all right. What is um, what are you going to have to do? And and I'm sitting here saying, well, let's see. We've got to get the uh, general fund money up. You've got to get the uh, the athletic budget up. You've got to raise. Oh, if we're going to do tier two and tier three of the facility improvements, mm-hmm. oh, another sixty seventy million dollars on top of that. And you're taking this job at a time when the oil and gas industry is really really struggling. How how in, in this position can you come in and find enough ways to diversify to stay on track with the goals you want to accomplish, given what's happening with the economy right now in this area? Yeah, and, you know, I, I heard those comments. Um, you know, I was there about 48 hours here recently before the press conference leading up to it and, and met quite a few people that, you know, they're, they're involved with RCAS and certainly the, the executive committee and things like that. And I, I can't tell you how many times I heard the price of oil and, you know, oil and gas and where it's at. I mean, I know it affects a lot of people and it affects that industry. But the one thing that we can really fall back on, and I'll, I'll keep going back to this, is and, – and you just don't understand. You take you might take it for granted, and I'm, I'm talking about everybody in the Lafayette community, is there is tremendous support for this program in the community. And I know, you know, a school like LSU is right down the road. I get that. I've dealt with that before. I worked at Ohio University when Ohio State was 70 miles up the road. That can be difficult sometimes. But the passion that's there for the Raging Cajuns in Lafayette, I, I can see it. I can feel it. I go into stores. And I see the, the Raging Cajun display even bigger than the LSU display in a lot of places that you didn't see that in, in Athens a lot of the time. So the, you, the, the passion and the commitment and the buy-in, you know, from the board and all of that is, is there at a high level. And once that's there, that's what you need. That's step one. And that's already been accomplished. And so now you look at, okay, 
how can we really involve this? And I keep coming back to the same point of when the university does well, when the university brand is strong, and I'm talking the entire university, when you're getting a lot of applicants and you you're, you're, can be more selective in who you let into the institution, which ideally is going to help the overall institution's GPA, which will help in terms of, you know, scholars and scholarships and internships and graduate assistant uh, assistantship placements, you know, all those things that, that really promote the university in a positive light, retain faculty, all those things happen when you've got a strong university brand. And then over on our athletic side, the stronger the athletic department is, and when we say this all over the country, the athletic department is a free advertisement for the university, and it's a window into the university. I always point to Boise State as an example. I mean, I grew up in Indiana, lived in Ohio, lived in Florida. I, you know, I, I've been to Boise once in my life, but everybody knew Boise State football. They knew the blue turf. They knew the run-and-gun offense. They knew winning the Fiesta Bowl against Oklahoma on their Statue of Liberty play. That didn't cost the university anything to advertise that. That was all free advertisement based on how they became America's darlings for a little bit of time. And admissions and enrollment and everything just shot through the roof at a school like Boise State. That's what the Raging Cajuns can do and have done to some extent with the success in baseball and certainly success in football and softball, you know, the sports that I've I've already kind of talked about. And so when that brand is strong and that image is strong, there's, there's, there's institutional pride. Your alums, no matter where they live, across the country, they have pride. So they'll start throwing their hat on and their polo on and their shirt on because they want it to be seen because it's, yeah, that was us. Yeah, that's in, you know, we're on the cover of USA Today or whatever it may be. And and then locally, you get it all the way down in Lafayette. It doesn't matter if you're a business owner that went to LSU or if you've got a law degree from there or whatever. If you live and you make your business and you work and your clients and everything and you're buying groceries and gas. If you're the Lafayette community, why wouldn't you want your school in in Lafayette to do well and to be nationally known? Those people can buy into this product with tickets or advertisements or donations just the same, even though, yeah, you may be an LSU person or you may be a Texas A&M person or whoever, but, but have pride locally. Have pride in your town, in your community, in your school that's in your town. And, and so that's really what we're trying to do. Yeah, the economy will affect it a little bit, certainly. I mean, I had to fundraise through the, the big stock market downturn that we had, you know, 07, 08, 09. That was not a fun time to be talking to people about giving money away when people are losing left and right in the market. And I know that to some extent with the oil and gas, that's happening still, you know, obviously in Lafayette. But there's ways to generate excitement and enthusiasm and support and, and get them on board. And then when it does get healthy again, maybe that's when the dollars can flow in. But it's, you know, that activity will, will breed that productivity down the line for what we're trying to accomplish. You said on Friday that the, the first order of business was to uh, develop a strategic plan. Um, you know, a strategic plan for fundraising, is it basically the same at or University A, B, and C? Or is each strategic plan decidedly different? I think they're, they're going to be somewhat different. I, you, you can't always treat a, you know, a private institution in a state the same as you can a large public institution. Some are in, you know, you, you can't have a strategic plan at Indiana University like my strategic plan was at Ohio University. Those are both state public institutions, but they're two different levels of schools with two different areas as well. You know, a, a, with the alums that Indiana has, and much you know, Indiana is twice the size of Ohio in terms of, of enrollment and so in terms of alumni and those type of things, and, and competing in a conference like the Big Ten, you're, you're going to be different than Ohio, where Ohio was one of you know six or seven schools in its own conference in its own state in the MAC, you know, with Miami and Akron and Kent and Bowling Green and Toledo and all these other schools that are that are in the state all centered around a huge Ohio State in the hub, in in the capital of Columbus. So our strategic plan had to be a little bit different than ours at Indiana, where Indiana was kind of the top school in the state in a a lot of ways Um, that that wasn't private. You know, Notre Dame's in the state. That's going to be a different one as well because you're talking a different type of alumni, a different type of budget for the university. They can do more things at a private school that we might not necessarily be able to do at a public institution. So I think it's going to be a little bit different based on where you're at based on what sports you know, generate the most interest in your school. You know, other than um, Indiana and maybe Northwestern, 
every other school in the Big Ten, their primary sport is football. That's what generates the most interest. Well, then, you know, it was basketball. And so we had to do things a little bit differently than some of our other counterparts would do because we had to, you know, we only had 10,000, we had a 17,000 seat arena, but, but 8,000 of those were students at IU. So we were only selling about 9,500 season, you know, season tickets. We had to generate as much income as we could out of there because these other institutions are, are selling 60, 70, 80,000 season tickets for football, you know, and so they're able to get a lot more revenue. So we had to be a little bit more creative. So it's, it's really just looking at the priorities that RCAF has in place, that Scott Farmer, the AD, has in place, play within the rules and the system of university advancement in John Bloom's area, but really kind of look at what they want to accomplish and, and really set our strategy based on timing, you know, need, all of those type of things, and, and really put that in place as quickly as we can. You, um, one of the things that I find interesting about you and your background is uh, you were um, most recently at the University of South Florida, and that's an institution mm-hmm that plays in the American Athletic Conference. And that is a league that I think a lot of Rage and Cajun supporters would love to see this school be a part of at some point in time. Mm -hmm. Right now, the university has about a $21 million athletic budget. In your Mm -hmm. opinion, how much does that athletic budget need to grow? So that way, when the next round of conference realignment comes around, that there's a conference that's looking and say, you know, these these folks down in Lafayette, Louisiana, I think would be a great fit for our conference. Yeah, and that, that's a great question. And I'm certainly no expert in this area. Uh, I'll, I'll lead with that. You know, I've been a part of these dis- discussions before, sitting on senior staff at, at Ohio University and, and University of South Florida, two separate different conversations. You know, a, a school like USF really desires to be in – a conference like the Big 12 or, you know, the ACC or something like that. that. That I believe that would be their ultimate goal to try and get there. A school like the MAC, uh, like Ohio University and the MAC, you know, we were looking at can we get, to, whether it be Conference USA or can we be appealing enough for the American at some point or something along those lines. What I will say about the American after, uh, you know, having spent time at, at USF, I, I do believe it was an undervalued league at the beginning. I think a lot of people viewed that league as, some leftovers from the Big East and some, you know, some, some of those that jumped from Conference USA. That was really kind of the hodgepodge of how it was formed. And nobody really knew the value of that league. And really in the first year, which was when I was at USF, you know, Connecticut wins the, the national championship in basketball. And so, we, you know, we're the national champions, our league. And, and, and then the football success, I, I can't even remember the, the stats exactly, so I don't even want to throw a number out there, but the number of bowl games we won that year and the number of bowl games we participated in. And I know that ESPN came to the league and said, you know, I think we kind of undervalued this deal a little bit. We, we're going to renegotiate your contract. The reason I say all that is because you, you pointed at this $21 million budget at, at University of Louisiana. By making a leap to a conference like that, that budget's automatically going to grow because of that TV revenue and the lock in bowl. Um, you know, alignments and things like that 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 league has. So automatically it's going to grow a little bit. But really it's more about right now in in that discussion, it's more about the sustainability and the potential of the school, which is why in in terms of competition and success, Louisiana is already at that level. I mean, you look at, and I'm not going to call schools by name, but you look at the schools in in the American Athletic Conference and you look at their national success in in the key sports, and Louisiana is already beating them. They're already past them in a lot of those areas. And so there's no doubt that the school fits in a league like that. But that's not always what these committees and the presidents and, and the uh, commissioners and everything look for. You know, you look at the Big Ten and you look at, man, they added Rutgers and they added Maryland, they added Nebraska. You know, some of those were people were like, why? And, and, you know, a lot of it came down to potential, came down to market share, came down to TV market size and, and how many individuals. So, um, you know, and, and then there's always some politics that play into it as well. Are there other schools in those leagues that are in your state? How are they going to feel about it if you go? And, you know, and, and you know, USF, we were always saying, well, who would UCF go over us or would we go? And so there's a lot of things that play into that question more than just budget. And I think all I can say is I think Louisiana is doing the proper things to position itself for a move like that. They've, they've won at a high level. They've proven they can retain coaches in key sports. They're making an investment in the student-athlete experience, which is really that coach retainment and facilities. And you look at the student-athlete performance center that's getting ready to come online. 
and you're you're looking at this commitment and investment that's going to be made in in a football program that's that's had national success and a baseball program that has competed at the highest level at nationally and then the other priorities kind of down the line of the basketball and how that would affect men's and women's and you know what it be tennis and and all these other areas they're they're making the right investments in the right things to position the university for a move like that. And and I think they're going to be very, very appealing to a lot of people. I've sat in some of those meetings before, and the University of Louisiana has been thrown out. I know they're on the radar. And so it's just, let's just keep doing what we do. You know, my athletic director at Ohio used to say, hey, we're, we're comfortable where we're at. We're happy where we're at. All we got to do is keep winning. If we just keep winning our league in, in a bunch of things, people are going to want us. And that's all we can control. If we can just, you know, keep the best coaches, give them the best experience for our athletes in terms of facilities and budget and everything and keep winning at a high level, that stuff's going to come. It'll take care of itself. Jim Harris is the executive director of the Raging Cajun Athletic Foundation. He's my guest this afternoon on Bird's Eye View. When we return, we're going to go ahead and take the list of everything that needs to be done, and then we're going to see if Jim's going to resign before he even starts. This is Bird's Eye View. I'm Jay Walker, and you're listening to ESPN 1420 at ESPN1420.com. No one has your local sports covered like Sports Radio ESPN 1420. ESPN 1420.com. Jay Walker, it's Bird's Eye View. And our final segment got about oh, a little under 10 minutes uh, to go with uh, Jim Harris, who is the um, new executive director of the Rage and Cajun uh, Athletic Foundation. You're... People here in Louisiana, universities here in Louisiana, that are trying to raise money for athletics are in a, a, a bit of a quandary that most schools in most states don't have to worry about. And I'm speaking specifically about student fees for athletics. I mean, I, I know that there's a couple of schools in South Florida um, that used to be in this conference where about 80 to 85 percent of the revenue that they have is based on student fees for athletics. You can't do that here in the state of Louisiana. How do you make up the difference? That's, that's a good, that's a good point, And it's a good question. Yeah, there are, it's not always an equal playing field when you're looking at athletic department budgets because state to state, it's different based on policies and whatnot. You know, at, uh, at Indiana, we did not have a student fee for, for a long time. And, you know, we, we took it to a vote to the student body. We, we we had given them so many tickets for uh, basketball, and we took a vote to the student body, and they turned it down and said, no, we don't want him to do a student fee. And so he said, well, we're going to have to make up that money somewhere, so we're going to have to take 500 seats away from you students and sell them to the general public and, and make the revenue up that way. And they quickly backed away and said, no, 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 wait, never mind. We want to do it. You know, We want to keep our seats. And, and so we had a little bit of leverage that we could use in that situation. And, and again, that's just one example of what a school can do. Uh, you know, which isn't always ideal, but again, this is at the end of the day, athletic directors and, and administrators are held accountable for for trying to run a, a balanced budget and a bottom line to an athletic program, and, and just like any other area of the university. So really, it just comes down to again, you know, finding that you've got to make it up in a number of ways, whether it's ticket sales, whether it's increased donations, whether it's sponsorships and and revenue through you know marketing avenues and and whatnot. And, and that's just what it comes down to. You know, I mentioned the brand earlier, and, and really it helps the Lafayette community when the University of Louisiana competes at a high level and, and performs academically at a high level. And the, the investors in the community are all involved in that. You know, all of the people that live there are invested in that product and wanting to see the university do well. You know, those are the people that we need to rely on. And then the alums across the state, you know, as you start to branch out and, and treat it into different areas of the, of the state, you know, the alums and the fans and, and the graduates and everybody that, that are spread out across the state of Louisiana, you know, maybe they can't get down to Lafayette for but once a year for a homecoming or, a, a you know, a football game or basketball game or whatever it may be, but they can still show their support and show their pride and show their appreciation. You know, I think the amount of, of success that University of Louisiana has had in the last few years has earned them the right to talk to their alums and talk to their fans about supporting the program because of the institutional pride that they've brought those individuals. And, and I think it's important. The more that they invest in the program, the more we can do that again. Everybody likes watching us win bowl games. Well, let's keep doing it. But we need that investment and that support to be able to do that. I, um, I wonder, uh, as you start saying, okay, you know, you've got um, 
you've got this much money for uh, tier two of the uh, facilities plan. You need to raise this much money for tier three to happen. You got to raise this much money because you want to get the budget up. Where do naming rights fit into all of this? Yeah, you know, naming rights are, are more commonly associated with facility campaigns, uh, obviously, because you're actually putting your name on something, and, and that's usually tangible. Um, I, you know, it's been done before in terms of endowment funds and things along those lines that it's not tangible in terms of bricks and mortar. You can see it as you're driving past on the highway. It's more tangible in terms of the way we announce the, the um, you know, the scholastic achievement of of our athletes and setting up scholarships with inst- uh, particular sports and things along those lines. You know, naming opportunities can go all the way down to coaches' offices and administrators' offices and things like that. You know, that that's very commonplace. If you tour athletic departments across the country and just walk through their administration or walk through their coaches' areas, it's very common to see a former soccer player, you know, name the men's or women's soccer head coaches' office or even assistant coaches' offices. So that, that plays a very important part in this. You know, that's that's one of the ways we can steward an individual's gift for what they've done and really make them feel proud and, and create a legacy for that individual and, and really what they've given. A naming right or a naming gift is certainly one of the ways that, that we like to take advantage of doing that and giving them that opportunity. The word transparency is something that you used a little bit earlier uh, when it comes to letting your donors, letting your fans, letting your season ticket holders uh, get a little better idea uh, of what you're doing, how you're doing it, and how long it's going to take you to do it. Um, yep. how, how transparent, though, can you get? I mean, obviously you can get maybe more transparent than the, the university has been, but, but is there a point where you get too transparent? Well, you know, I, I think there's a balance there. Transparency is is so important because transparency leads to trust. You know, and I think you have to be fair, you have to be equitable, and you have to be transparent. And I, I believe in those things. And that is going to generate trust with individuals. At any point in time, this is what I always said when we were implementing the, the reseeding and, and looking at our point structure and everything in Indiana, I always said this to my staff. I said, at any point in time, if a donor wants to come to us and say, why, wait a minute, why? We need to be able to answer that, and we all need to be able to answer it the same way because this is why we're doing it. And I think that's important. You know, we're it's it's we're no different than any other company. You know, if you're and I, I don't I don't like to do it in these terms usually, but just to create a picture here, you know, if you're if you're choosing a bank or if you're choosing an insurance company to work with or whatever, you want to get the facts. You want to find out what are the fees, what are the hidden fees, and what's my customer service going to look like, and what's, you know, how am I going to get my statements, and you, you want to get all that information. Well, we're no different. This is something that individuals, they're doing business with us. They want to invest in their product, and, you know, we need to be able to tell them this is what would happen because a lot of times in athletics fundraising, it is kind of, there, there is some transactional fundraising that takes place. Some people only donate or only give because they want to park here or they want to sit here or they want to have tickets to this or they want to make sure they can get a ticket to the bowl game. That's, that's some people's motivation to do it, and that's fine. That's not everybody. Some do it for the philanthropic reasons. Some do it for the tax benefit. I mean, there's all different types of people that give for all different types of reasons, and we have to be able to accommodate and cater to all those individuals at the same time being able to explain you know, in a fair way and in a transparent way why the system's in place, how it benefits, you know, what the, the, the needs are and, and why we're doing it in this particular fashion. And I think that's important. All right. You've got, um, you've got a point system that you need to put together, and, and you've got reseeding that you have to do. You've got to get the general budget up. You've got to raise money for facilities. Uh, and I'll bet you I come up with about four or five other things that would probably be considered very, very important as far as things that you have to structure and get together. You don't have much of a staff right now, uh, and and one person uh, can't do this alone. So I guess a two pronged question as we wrap up here: um, Are you is this an area where you're going to be able to expand the staff and get more people working on this than you have right now? And um, how do you prioritize? What comes first? Yep. And I'll answer the second part of that first. I, I asked that same question in the interview process, and I said, tell me a little bit about – I see everything you want to do, and obviously that can't all be done at the same time. Tell me 
you know, where that priority lies. Which one are we doing first? Is it this one or this one or this one? And the answer was yes. <laughs> so obviously I, I, know, I know where the uh, athletic department's priorities are in terms of let's get it done as quickly as possible, and, and certainly we would all like that. But, but fundraising and development is a process. You know, I, you don't go into someone's office the first time you meet them and ask them for a large gift. Maybe you can ask them to support the program and, and be a part of the community. And, you know, like I said, when, when Lafayette, when U- University of Louisiana does well and the Lafayette community does well, you know, and, and maybe you can get a, an annual gift or, or something small to, to get them involved and get them going and, and see how we are as an organization. But you don't do that at a, at a large scale level. You get to know the individual. You, we want to learn their interests, their passion, you know, what, what their needs are from a financial standpoint and, and really just get to know them. And that, that takes time to do this the right way. You know, in terms of a staff, you know, that they've, they've asked me that question. That the whole point in this, you know, in bringing me in to, as executive director to lead this organization is in one statement would be to professionalize this organization and this athletic foundation. And the term professionalize, it means combining that art and that science, building up a proper staff to compete at the levels that we already are at and that we aspire to get to. And that's adding more staff, and that's building a process, and that's having certain individuals focus on annual fund, which we have a few that do it now, but it's not their primary job. They're involved in other things as well. We need people focusing, living, breathing, RCAF, Raising Cajun Athletics, fundraising every day, not just me, not just our board of directors, we, not just our fans. You know, we, we need everybody involved in, in doing that. And that includes bringing in staff, some working on annual funds, some working on reseeding and, and priority points, myself and some others on the executive committee, work, and Scott Farmer certainly working on major gifts and trying to, to work with community foundations and corporations and individuals. So, yes, that's the answer. There is a process here, and my first you know four weeks, six weeks is going to be devoting to, to laying out those paths and really start – start driving down all those paths at the same time, knowing when to put the brakes on one and when to hit the accelerator on the other. And that's really, but that's what I do. That's, that's part of this professionalizing the organization. So I'm looking forward to that challenge. Jim Harris is the executive director of the Raging Cajun Athletic Foundation. Uh, you know what? I could do another hour here, but I'm not going to. We're out of time, uh, and I want to thank you for coming on and also uh, invite you to come back uh, anytime because I got more stuff I'd like to know, and I'm sure that you'd like to educate folks a little bit more. And so uh, as a result, my door is open and hopefully yours is too. Well, I'm certainly going to take advantage of that now that you've offered it. It's, I think it's important to keep the RCAF brand name out there and, and get as many people on board. And as we talk about reseeding and that transparency I mentioned, I, you know, I want to get that out there and I want, I want people to ask questions and, and I want it to be visible. So I'll certainly take you up on that. And I appreciate you having me on the show today. It's been fun. All right, Jim, thanks so much. And we'll see you when you get to town. Sounds great. I look forward to it. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jim. Jim Harris, Executive Director of the uh, Raging Cajun Athletic Foundation.